Hi, my name is uh, Douglas Vode. I am the publisher of Vector Associates. And uh, uh, after 30 plus years, I finally got my friend, Abelard Reichlin, to do an interview of his infamous or famous book called The True Authorship of the New Testament. Some of you may have seen it advertised in Nation, New Republic, etc., where it says, Flavius Josephus writes New Testament. Well, uh, he's the first one in history that openly wrote about it and figured out the whole family relationship of who wrote the New Testament, when the books were written, the code systems that the Pisos used in writing it. So if you're a theologian, amateur professional, uh, regardless whether you're uh, Catholic, Protestant, Baptist, uh, Jewish, or even if you're Muslim and curious about uh, this whole story, you're going to love this. This is a real treat. You're going to learn more about not only Roman history, but the code systems and, and how it was written and the proof that Abelard is right and everybody else is wrong. So I've got a couple of questions for him. And what you see up, uh, above us here is the family tree that we'll partially go through so you understand the relationship of who wrote what, how the books were written, the years they started, and how it progressed. Because uh, that's a big mystery for many scholars is, is how the books were written, when they were, and stuff like that. So, um, Abelard, thank you for taking my invitation and finally doing this. Uh, first question. Um, uh, what came you about? Why did you decide to write this? Or how did you get curious about the New Testament? Many, many people are curious about the New Testament. They can't understand why a small group of supposedly persecuted Christians could persevere in the catacombs for 35 years, hiding from the Roman legionaries who supposedly are trying to find and kill them. And the legionaries knew the catacombs far better than did these poor, straggling, uneducated Christians. For sure. And it's a mystery. Where were they for 35 years, and how did they come out of the catacombs? Well and alive after 35 years, with great new leaders that nobody had ever heard of before. Where did the Christians come from? How did they escape the legionaries in the catacombs for 35 years? That's how I got onto it. I was an attorney for over 50 years, but like many people want to become an attorney and they don't make it, I made it to become an attorney and I always wanted to become a detective. Well, I read Agatha Christie, I read Sherlock Holmes, and then I got on to the New Testament because I was so curious about how did they manage to hide for 35 years in the catacombs? <laughs> the, uh, I want to also say, explain one thing. The reason why we're not showing his face, he's going to be famous one day, really famous. But he doesn't want to be that famous right now as the subject is sensitive to a lot of people. And it affects two of the world's great religions. So you're going to see his lovely head in the back of his head. And, uh, uh, but to give you an idea, he's been selling this book, or we have also, since 79, I think it was, right, when we first published 1981, it. 1981, finally. Well, that's when you finally decided to bring it public. Right. Right. Instead of just trying to get the rabbis to accept it. But because my Jewish friends were just too, too stubborn too stubborn, and too afraid to get involved with Christianity because they had, had so many problems of being persecuted, hated, treated with contempt, and finally murdered in mass in Catholic Europe and in Russia and in Poland. And they didn't want any part of this. No question. But... Uh, uh, but over the years, if you search on the internet, uh, if you search for just Arius Calpurnius Piso, the star of this story, you'll find 335 web pages that have the name listed. For Abelard Reichlin, which is him, 3,080 mention him, which means they're talking about the true authorship. And when you search for the true authorship of the New Testament, with quotes around it, of course, 
we got 967. That's how many web pages or, or news groups have people talking about the book. Some have estimated that as many as a million people worldwide know about the pesos, and it's all because of him and and releasing this information to the world. So, uh, let me see. My first question, I think, for you is, um, well, the family tree. Let's get to the first thing. Uh, who was the first one who came up with the idea of a Jesus Savior? The one who came up with the idea of a Savior for the Judeans, as the Jews were then called, was T. Flavius Sabinus, who was the head Son. of the Flavian family who lived in Etrusca, which was Etruria, which was northwest of the city of Rome. And their leader was T. Flavius Sabinus. Sabinus was because it was near the Sabine River. Flavius was because it was gold and they liked that for their name. T. Flavius Sabinus. He wrote, not much, but he wrote a small compendium of Roman history under the name, his literary name of Valeus Paterculus. And he was the one who came up with the idea and gave it to his son, who happened to be married to Arachina Sr., or Arius Sr., who turns out to be the link between the two families. Yeah, we have two families here. We have, well, the father was Valeus Paterculus. He's the one who gave the idea to his son, Valeus, uh, the son, uh, Sabinus. The other son became Vespasian, the emperor, and, and died in 96. No, in uh, 81. Died in 81? His son, Domitian, his son and last successor, died in 96. Oh, got it. Okay, so when did he take, when did he take power? He took power in 79. So he was there for two years. So he was only there for two years. Maybe but his son, Titus, bit. ruled with him, and Titus lived until the year, uh, he took, excuse me, 69 he took over, not 79. He took over in 69. Oh, 69, okay. And Titus ruled till 79 when supposedly he ate some poisoned boiled fish, perhaps uh, supplied uh, intentionally or unintentionally by his brother Domitian. And Domitian took over and ruled until 96. That was the end yeah. of the Flavian dynasty. So, and the, the important part of here is also his wife was Arya Sr. And their daughter, Arya Jr., was winds up marrying... Of the great one. Well, uh, the father of Arius, Gaius C. Calpurnius Piso. Right. Also known as Reyes Paetus. His wife is Arya Jr. And there's an interesting story about that we'll get to later with, with the um, emperor. Um, okay, we'll stop at this point and we'll go on to this after these, these other questions. Um, who did the story pass through that eventually ended up as the current version of the bookmark? The bookmark is evidently the first one and evidently the most difficult to figure out. It is because it had so many different authors adding things to it. So we have him giving the idea to his son who writes the earliest version but it doesn't have a lot of the names in it yet. No. It's, it's just a, it's just a uh, basically just a sketch. Then his, his son-in-law, Gaius C. Piso, takes over and finishes Urmarcus. Now the reason why it's Urmarcus is why? From Sabinus's name, Furius was a, was a noble name in Roman history of a great conqueror, and he was one of those who used the name Furius. It meant ferocious, and it also meant, uh, uh, from the German, it supposedly meant original. But actually, it was a name that ties together the Pisos for a number of generations, including the fact that uh, eventually, the fictional uh, King Arthur has a, a, a fictional father who is named uh, Furius Pendragon. So Furius was a great, great, honorable name. So all they did was the so all they did was chop off the F and tell the I chop off the suffix. That's right. And they had Ur Marcus. Ur from. So he's giving credit to to Flavius Sabinus for developing it further than the 
tuberculosis. That's right. That's basically it. So basically, there's like four different authors to this mark. That's so, why it's so complicated. And the hardest book to figure out. So we have the father, Gaius Calpurnius Piso, his wife, Aria Jr. At this point, I wanted to say in, in the book, Mark, it doesn't talk about a virgin birth at all. That was developed later. In, in chapter 1, verse 11, it, it then says, and there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now that happens after John the Baptist baptizes him. But uh, the reason why they use that as a son is because they were plagiarizing right from uh, Ezekiel. Where in, I think, chapter 41 or 42, there's a prince who sits in front of, um, with God. And a prince is obviously the son of a king. And that's where they borrowed it from. And later, in chapter 6, verse 3, it then winds up saying, Is not the carpenter the son of Mary? They finally introduce the name Mary, which means Gaius must have written from that section on. But explain why he uses Mary. They used Mary, which was a... Later, it was the name Mary. They used the name Mariam, M-A-R-I-A-M. Because uh, they wanted to create a tie-in with uh, Moses' mother, Miriam. But they changed the I to an A. Because Piso was playing the game that he was the mother as well as the father. Like the, like the rhyme in, uh, in one of the Shakespearean plays. Uh, which speaks of I'm my mother, father, and yet his child, etc., etc., etc. One man playing many parts on the stage of life. 